This is an audio-visual podcast for Vision Week New Zealand 2020. Vision Week New Zealand is about creating an ambitious long-term vision for New Zealand, for our lifestyles, including economic, social, cultural, environmental outcomes. In this podcast, we'll be looking at residential streets, as well as town centre streets, as extensions of our living rooms. This presentation builds on the geography influencing behaviours and the Creative Industries podcast, which looked on the employment side of how to build resilience and influence spatial form in our cities. This podcast will now look at the residential side of going down site specific and looking at how we can use spatial planning and urban geography to influence behavior and urban form. If you have any questions, comments, or would like to start a dialogue, you can contact me at ben at colab.nz. Going right back to the beginning, transport begets land use, land use begets transport, both beget the user environment in a city. In my first podcast, we looked at right back up at regional and interregional level and how urban geography and spatial planning can influence the user environment through transport and land use. In the second podcast, we came down to site specific, so Monaco City Centre, looking at how creative industries and the transport system can be used to diversify the employment base so you have a more resilient employment base that supports a full-time economy. And now we're going to look at the other side of the coin, so industry and employment on one side, residential now on the other side of the coin. So we're going to look at how uh, residential and extending the living rooms of those residential areas can be then translated into town and metropolitan centres and how they realise that ambition long-term vision for a positive lifestyle, including economic, social, cultural and environmental outcomes. And just a little bit about myself, I am an urban geographer and spatial planner here based in southern Auckland. I'm a human experience engineer for CoLab and Associates, where I've done advocacy work and partnership work on larger projects like the Al Manukau Transform Urban Renewal Project and the Airport to Botany Rapid Transit Project, also coming down to smaller projects like street coming parklets and bus lanes. Also recapping, we're looking at the bounce forward in the post-COVID area era. So again, social distancing is ingrained in this generation, just as being frugal was in our into our grandparents in the Great Depression. There is still a strong desire to use active modes, and there is a very strong desire to buy and support local. No, that does not mean the fortress economy. That means just supporting more support for local businesses and local industry, but we still have the realization that we will be still importing products as well. But for example, we're more likely to support a small business, mom and pop business, rather than say a big multinational chain store, uh, chain company. Despite what's happened in Auckland and the removal of most of our technical urban infrastructure, that infrastructure again is going to be attempted to roll out because the demand for more transit and cycling interventions is present. And there's also becoming a slow realisation in New Zealand of the benefits of mixed use rather than single use zoning and local amenities. My bounce forward vision is the 20 minute city as Paris has touted. The elimination, if not mitigation, of the super commuter. Super commuters where you have to travel more than 30 minutes by any mode, like particularly trans transit and active modes from your home to your job and back again. Uh, better integration and cooperation between the regions, particularly the Golden Triangle, which is what my first podcast covered. The re-emergence of industry after 40 years of post-industrialization. That's what my second podcast looked at using creative industries. Walkable and oriented, transit orientated environments. They attract jobs. Again, in my second podcast, as we came down site specific, 
And this presentation, the residential, also runs in parallel with the walkable orientated environments that attract jobs. Again, that presentation looked on the industry and employment side of the lead of the coin. This podcast looks on the residential side of the coin. So we are looking at extending the living room. And when I mean the living room, we're also we're talking about residential areas, but we're also talking about the hospitality and retail areas in our centres as well, whether it's a local centre, a town centre, or a large metropolitan centre. You can see two examples here of attempts through an urban simulator to extend the living rooms. In this case here, we've got a high density area and we're using street hierarchy. That is your four and six lane roads usually form the outer boundary with then feeder roads running from those arterial roads then through the middle and limited extent and then you use your smaller narrow roads or even transit or pedestrian malls depending on what the area is. In this case it's residential so we're using uh, laneway roads and pedestrian malls to run between the fronts of the residential buildings which are then interconnected by parks. On this side we again we're using our hierarchy you have the feeder roads running each side but in this time the, instead of having the front yard or the, the living room going on to street going out to the street we've actually turned it around we've actually turned it to the back where you've got this uh, pathway that runs through the middle but the middle of two residential sections connected by a park and those parks are done sporadically so this is if you look here this is using where the front your living room faces the front and onto the streets. This is where your residential living room f is facing the back and is connected by a common pathway with parks every so often. So it works front and back. Now the living room concept came about after the term the third space was coined. It hasn't entered the urban geography lexicon yet, but it's still used in the urban design. Remember, we've come down to site specific this time. So, a residential area, a residential neighborhood, a town center, or a metropolitan center. So, we've come from again into regional level right down to site specific. And the third space was interpreted as the first space being the home, the second place being work or school, and the third place being the public spaces. And from an urban geography and spatial planning point of view, I can see how that third space term is coined. And this is how streets and common pathways and even parks, if, if the area back, if your residential or town centre backs onto a park, should be treated as extension of our living rooms. So living room, living rooms from house to street to metropolitan centres. Living rooms are often where people entertain the most, given humans as social creatures. It doesn't matter if you're an extrovert or an introvert. The living rooms are often where people will interact. You also got to remember through thousands of years of cultural evolution, humans are nomadic as well. So we will tend and often tend to seek out and explore new places. And as a result, you're going to meet other people as well. Also, as I, as I point out here, I'm sure there's a subdiscipline of this, and I need to go and look it up one day. There's the geography of coffee. Because humans are nomadic, and because humans are social creatures through thousands of years of cultural evolution, hospitality is a big part in the spatial or geographic experience in an urban environment also a rural environment but i'm talking about an urban environment here i'm an urban geographer not a rural geographer and so people will often meet up over places of hospitality whether it be coffee tea lunch or even beer and they will come together and interact and there's also the uk saying which came to new zealand initially but it's now frowned upon it as the wet lunch where you all gathered together over lunch and a beer, and you used to discuss, and I say this in parentheses, matters of state. 
It's also where business would used to be performed. Do you sign the deal in your office behind the computer or do you sign that deal in a social in a social setting? And that can look, it goes back to residential areas as well. So you put this all together and you have a definite urban geography and urban design commonality. That is, living spaces are often very close, very close to places of hospitality. Your living room is cl often close to your kitchen and either your front or backyard, or if you're in a high density area, a common area. And with commercial areas, so your town and metropolitan centres, that will be a cafe being close to a square, again a park, if not close to a street. Note I said street, not road. Street. There's a difference between the two. So we know where our living space living spaces are in residential and town centre areas. The question is, how do we now extend them while acknowledging the private public space sphere and realms and turn them into true living spaces? Remember, we are trying to achieve the long-term vision for our lifestyles to be positive lifestyles that include economic, social, cultural, and environmental outcomes. Remember, this is the post-COVID era. We're trying to re-foster those positive interactions. Looking at the residential street as an outdoor living room. The quote says, considered in another context, we recognize almost live in places facing a street functioning in the practical role. And that practical role provides a means of travel to connect with ourselves with the world. As I showed back here, your living space can connect front ways out to a street. Or, in some cases, it can connect backwards and connect from the back. Okay. Strictly saying this has been a bit stuck for language, this mightn't be a street per se, but it's still a common path area where people would go from their back onto the common area to connect others with the world. And then you've got a park here forming as a common area. So our streets, note streets have been used, not roads. Streets. Roads are used to move people and freight at a mass level. So you have an arterial road, but you'll notice in geography and engineering language, you don't have an arterial street. Note the difference between the two. Arterial road, but not arterial street. So roads and streets are two very different things. Roads are used to move goods and people at a mass level. Streets is where we come to interact with the world from our homes. So our streets form our communities where we mingle with our neighbours and share various collective values. We take these for granted that these roles are a variation of our citizenry. So streets, so you've got your individual homes, you've got your individual town centres with the individual cafes. The streets is what binds it together. And this is where we get to share our collective values. Note collective values, not individual values, collective values. This is about the collective, whether it's at interregional, regional, subregional, or site specific. We are sharing our various collective values, and this needs to be fostered. For example, there's no way you are going to be able to share our, those collective values values and mingle with our neighbours with a six-lane arterial road fronting your front yard. Not going to happen. It just doesn't allow it. But a street or a shared path or a transit mall will allow that to happen. And in history, prior to the 19th century, 19th century, streets were places of interaction and, ext and extensions of our living space. However, through the Industrial Revolution and the advent of the railway, heavy industry had come into the city and often very close to the residential areas, which means minimised chances of social interaction. 
although deindustrialization would happen after World War II through the 1990s, those social interactions would still be minimized because the road came along and the car came along and the highway came along. And you will note highways and large four to six lane arterial roads will sever you from your public spaces. But in the 21st century, people in cities were realizing that streets form that connection between those individual living spaces and allow us to mingle and share our collective values as a community. So they're trying to turn streets back into public spaces. High Street, Federal Street, Fort Street, O'Connell. Just note some of the places in Auckland City Centre. In Monaco, there's motions underway to get Armsham Way, Osterley Way, Putney Way, and even Romwood Avenue flipped back into streets. So we've got those connection points where in the Manukau Metropolitan Centre, we can interact and mingle together as a community and share those collective values. So if we look here, working on creating those extensions, if we look to the right here, these are the ingredients that are needed to form those living room extensions. Now, for Vision Week New Zealand, you're wondering why, why am I doing interregional planning or geography and spatial planning, then dropping down to site-specific on the employment side with creative industries, and now site-specific on the residential side. Because I'm going right back to the very beginning. If you cannot get these three things done properly, then anything else that might be put forward doesn't matter. If we cannot promote sustainable urban form, if we cannot use spatial planning to influence our behaviours and our user environment, remember transport begets land use, land use begets transport, both beget the user environment, then anything else doesn't matter. If you cannot get the foundations right, which is what this is, then how can you get the rest right? Because at the end of the day, we live at home, we go to work or school, and then we have our third space, the public spaces. So we've got the first part done, housing, haphazard as it might be. We're getting the employment sorted, but the third space is missing. It's like trying to make a cake with missing the bake, uh, with missing a key ingredient. Your cake, or even bread, miss out the yeast, your bread's not going to rise. So without these living room extensions, everything else previous mentioned or could be mentioned just does not happen. So I'm going right back to the beginning and trying to create that ambitious long-term vision for those positive lifestyles, including economic, social, cultural, and environmental incomes. Because if you have positive community spaces, positive living rooms, and a transit and transport system that connects these all up, not sever, connect, then we can realize those pos positive economic, social, cultural and environmental incomes, outcomes, sorry, well, incomes as well. And when those positive outcomes are there, we have better productivity, better mental health, your suicide rate ironically drops, inequality drops, class and race, and you have better environmental, human and physical outcomes in the city. Your city is running healthy. So we'll go back to working on the creating those living room extensions. In my fourth podcast, the final podcast for Vision Week New Zealand, I'll look at localized planning and how Auckland fails rather miserably at it and how it is a detriment and how it doesn't allow what I've said in the previous in this podcast and the previous two not to happen and how we can make it happen. So again, going back to working on creating the living room extensions, here's the mix walkable and mixed use. Note it doesn't say single use, whether that's single use residential or single use commercial. Side note, industry is always, apart from creative, industry is always single use because of its uh, environmental effects. That's a given. That's why industry is often on the fringe of the city. And if it's not on the fringe, it usually will end up that way. 
but walkable and mixed use. Mixed use, not single use, walkable, not four or six lane arterial roads. Okay, they are there as part of the street hierarchy, but they're not there as predominance, where you have your streets coming to uh, streets in place that allow that connect us all up, that allow us to mingle and share those collective values, allow us to form community. Those living room extensions need also to be safe. Now, in geography, we have what's called the fear of crime. It's often not crime itself that will drive people away from these walkable mixed use years. It's often the fear of crime, the perception of crime. No matter if crime could be zero in reality. But if the fear of crime is there, the perception of crime due to poor spatial planning and poor urban design, then we consider it not safe. We're not going to mingle in those spaces. And this is especially so for women, for children, for our elderly, and for our minority groups, whether it might be our people of colour or our LBGTI community. If our areas are not safe, those communities are not going to come out and, and be able to participate through the perception of fear of crime. And that's not on. That's not bringing our communities together. In living room extensions, schools must be nearby. From suburban areas where I reside, you've got your primary, your intermediate, and your high school. But we often lack those schools in our big metropolitan centres like Monaco and Auckland City Centre itself. So where are those people that live in Monaco City Centre and Auckland City Centre going to send their kids? If they have to send them out of the centre, then that defeats the purpose of living in the centre, doesn't it? Parks. I think this is pretty self-explanatory parks so you need parks at regular intervals and it doesn't need to be big 3000 square meter um, signature parks it can be your little 500 meter parklets too scattered at regular intervals but parks will often form combined with the street the nexus point of where we come together to interact as a community and this is more specifically so in medium and high density areas such as a metropolitan or a city center Child care. Do you have child care available? Community. Basically, walkable mixed use, safe, safe areas, schools, parks, and child care will allow the community to function. And of course, affordable, affordable housing options through all the typologies. Now, affordable housing is not just including that your mortgage, uh, the total price of your house cannot be more than three times the income of the household or three times the, your rent cannot be three times the income. It also includes transport. Now, if you've got big four and six lane arterial roads, that's going to uh, in cause induced demand, which is going to trigger the cars, which is going to back up whatever transit system you have. But if you have a proper transit system, proper active modes, and you have your streets that are allowed to walk, here we go. Here's that common path again, connecting park, park, playground, park. There's a park down here. Here's your residential, all connected up. We've got feeder roads that allow cars to go by and buses to go by at low speed. Actually, in this case, it's just cars. We have a four-lane road here, which has commercial flanking down it, or mixed use in this case. So here's your commercial, here's your residential. But that is a general lane and a bus lane to allow the bus to come down. But you have your hierarchy here to allow affordable housing, to allow community, to allow childcare, to allow parks, to allow schools. I think the school is out of shot on this one. Yes, it is. There's a school up here and there's a school down here. And the high school's over here. Safe. So you've got a lot of passive surveillance and walkable and mixed use. Again, look, note, in this case, the living room is back onto a common path. Well, they, which then connects up to parks there, 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 as well as mixed use. You still have your feeder roads and you still have your arterial road, which forms the loop. So this is a simulated example of it all coming together and it allows for affordable housing. And there's a bus there in action. Because everything is able to be accessed by transit, walking or cycling. So that drives down your transport costs. Remember, a car can cost you in Auckland alone, over $5,000 a year to run and maintain. 
So if you can minimize the use of the car or eliminate the use of the car, it's $5,000 a year saved. That gives you more affordable housing. You also notice there's a lot of trees, even in a high density area. Come to that in just a moment. Now I've got a question for you. Are you likely to entertain or live in a space where cars are roaring through, letting off noise and noxious gases, whether it's a residential area or a town centre? I highly doubt it. And the consequence is social exclusion, whether it's straight out isolation or sedimentary activities. And when that becomes prevalent, cue your mental physical issues or the super commute to get to a place of social interaction. So if you're having to go more than 10 minutes by walking or even car to get to a place of social interaction, whether that's a park or a place of hospitality, then we've got a small, we've got a problem here because it's going to uh, exclude those social interactions. It creates a negative feedback loop on itself and it means the area is not as attractive as a living space. Now you can turn that round and this is how you can do it. And it should be pointed out to realize this long-term vision of positive lifestyles including economic, social, cultural, and environmental incomes. These don't need to be expensive multi-million or even multi-billion dollar projects. This can be done simple and on the cheap, ranging from a simple policy change, such as bringing in the 30 kilometer an hour street, whether it's a town or metropolitan centre, or even the city centre itself, or a residential road. And credit to Auckland Transport and NCTA, this policy is underway. It's a bit haphazard to start with, but this policy is on its way. So we've got our first positive outcome. You can also then, once that's in place, start getting some treatments underway. Now that can be from removing cars outright, cue bollards, and flipping the area into a transit mall or a pedestrian mall. And then we come into the major step of transforming the roads back into streets. Now, you can do this on the cheap through what's called tactical urbanism. Small scale, quick win projects that you just do and it can be used as trials and they can be removed just as quick or then they can be executed and implemented into permanent projects. So once you've done your policy change, you're lowering your speed limits. You've done your basic treatments such as getting cars out of there and saying your tactical urban urbanism. Then you can go for the bigger projects to flip those roads back into streets. And once that's done, you start getting your extension of living rooms and spaces. And it should be noted there, tactical urbanism like parklets, curb build-outs, can be built to make the living room even more attractive. Just as we furnish and decorate our own living rooms and cafe at home, and cafes do in towns. So it doesn't need to be expensive projects. And you'll often find the smaller projects will often get the better utility, or simply put, better bang for your buck. So it's not anything huge or magical, it's often just going right back to basics. As it was once said, follow the KISS model, keep it simple, silly. Remembering positive living spaces, which then influence our lifestyles, including economic, social and cultural environmental outcomes, Positive living spaces, in this case our streets, can promote social inclusion. Inclusion, New Zealand has a social exclusion problem right now. Social inclusion, while cutting down on that super commute to other third spaces. Strong local cohesion promotes strong local community health. And if you have a strong local community, you then have a strong local subregion, which then you have a strong local, uh, sorry, strong region to which you didn't have a strong interregion to which you didn't have a strong nation you can see how it goes right up the hierarchy and right back down again who knew spa spatial planning and urban geography could influence spatial form transport and land use so much that it will impact on the user environment we have with our city so let's take a quick look at some examples using the simulator. Turning a residential road into a street. Remember, a road is used to move goods and people in mass. 
hence you have the term arterial road, but you'll never hear the term arterial street. Language matters. Whereas a street, if we go right back here, our streets form communities where we mingle with our neighbours, share various collective values. We take granted that these roles are a variation of our citizenry. So in this case, I've turned a two-lane road into a shared street. You'll notice the curbs are removed, so the street is level with the residential area. Because cars, resident, this street is still accessible by locals, but it's not used as a rat run. And to reinforce that point, we've got retractable bollards. And this can also work in a town centre as well. If you want an example of that, Freiburg Square in Auckland City Centre has retractable bollards, so our service vehicle's in, but the bollards remaining up to keep every other every other vehicle out. Now we're going to go to in this case a high density area, and I believe this is a residential area with a town centre next door. Again, this used to be a two lane road. We've now turned it into a transit mall. A transit mall continue allows the continuation of transit services, whether it's bus or trams to continue to use the road but pedestrians still take top priority but cars have been taken out so again the curb is removed it's level with the residential area the bus as you can see there still has access so this high density area st still has access to a transit line that runs every 15 minutes although it's at 20 kilometers an hour but it's still there and as you can see, here at the front, you can still use this as an extension of your living area. See the pedestrians walking through the middle of the road. Extension of your living area. So there's an example right there because we've removed the cars. We've removed the curbs. We've kept the transit line in there. And we've blocked off. There will, there will be bollards at either end to keep running traffic out. If this is not available and you still need to do keep your street in place, you can green it up. And it's this one's a simple one too. So this is instead of flipping it over to a straight up mall and dropping the curves, we've kept most of the road in place. But to humanize it, we've added trees. Now street greening also allows for shelter for both humans and wildlife. It also acts as stormwater protection and filtration. But we've removed the center line, we've removed the parking lines, and we've dropped the speed limit, this case, to 40. I actually dropped it even further to 30 after the shot was taken. But it allows the extension of what would become a residential area. So this area was to be built up. You also notice tram lines here too, so you can walk down and catch your tram. Again, this is not expensive. This can be done on the cheap and this can be done extremely quickly. There's nothing expensive here in turning our existing road and streetscapes into living room extensions for our commercial and town centers. The good thing is this can be done quick and it can be done rapidly. And it can be even community-led, bottom-up. In fact, it should be community-led. Are streets for people or cars? We've now gone into a metropolitan centre this time. So again, we've gone a little bit back out. The bollards are in place to prevent rat running. The curbs have been dropped, so the footpaths are level. The pedestrians, could, this is a night shot, so this was done on a Wednesday night at 2.30 in the morning, simulation-wise, and you can still see residents walking around. Again, through dropping the curves, taking the cars out. This is a pedestrian mall this time. So there's no transit. You'll see where the transit is in a minute. Residents can come down and mingle in here. And you can even have community markets and events can be just set up just like that, right in here without having to worry about traffic. So you can set up your Friday night markets or your Saturday morning markets just like that. Again, extension of our living room where we're able to come together and mingle and share our collective values. 
coming back out when they are combining streets and transit together to form a livable centre. So this entire area is a centre. And you can see the pedestrian mall there. This is the same pedestrian mall as, early, as this one. You can see in this case we've got a rare instance of the front being uh, coming down to a extended living area. We've also got the case of the back coming down into a extended living area because in this case we've got a park. So this forms a square with a park in the middle. So you've, you've got a rare case of forming up both sides. Now is there an example of this? Yes there is or potential there is and it's called Davis Avenue and Monaco City Centre once that's redeveloped. Now these residents have a very short walk to a major transit hub. In this case, we've got a bus station and a tram line. So a pedestrian mall next to a tram line or a bus station allows the residents and visitors to access the wider residential area, but it also allows to access other areas of the city. And in Monaco's case, you've got intercity services available. So a pedestrian mall next to a tram line this allows residents and visitors to both access the residential area while having readily available transit to either head to the commercial area nearby or transfer to city-wide transit connections. So this is really extending the living room to city-wide. And a metropolitan centre in Auckland would be the best for this. Now I'm going to be using my road hierarchy. Feeder road local road, shared space or a pedestrian path right up the middle. So your cars and your transit still have access while still being humane because the speed limits are dropped between 30 and 40 kilometers an hour. But also up the middle, so this is a low density area this time, we've also got a pedestrian path while re which cars can still, local residents can still access but at only 10 kilometers an hour. But as you can see that they're walking. So you've got your front yard extended right out and you can come together to mingle. And in this case, you'll find, most likely find your residents will be using this than rather using these. And also, never, ever, ever underestimate the power of street trees to ex when extending the living room, whether it's in a town centre, metropolitan centre or a residential area. They provide shelter and filtration, especially in storm events. Finally, this is from overseas. As I said right back at the beginning, businesses often overestimate the, the perception of mode share that we use to get to the town centers. I'm going to flip to the town centers quickly. They believe we come by car, then walking in transit, where it's actually walking, then transit. And this comes quickly to, I'll just mention this quickly, the linger factor. And this is particularly with hospitality. When you drive to a place of retail and hospitality, you're time limited. And if there's alcohol involved, you've obviously got drink driving. Where if you're able to walk or take transit, that limitation is removed and you're likely to stay longer, thus likely to spend more. So this is why I'm bringing this up, because this is the perception versus reality. Walking, cycling, bus, train, even taxi, scooter, so that can include Uber to a point, are supported by streets and transit malls. They're not supported by cars, which are supported by roads. And for living rooms to work in our town centres, in this instance, we need to realise this is the actual mode share because this is what living room extensions and streets support. They don't support this. This is supported by four and six lane roads. Remember how I said earlier, who would want to sit in the cafe with noisy cars and fumes? This is what some think. And this is why some overestimate. Whereas the reality is likely to be here. And this supports the living room extension in streets and vice versa. So they, it goes both ways. So this is why I've pointed it out.
Conclusion. Residential and town centre streets are, can be, are or should be treated as extensions of our living rooms because, again, we are social creatures and nomadic and also coffee culture. Reallocating those residential and centre streets does not need to be expensive. It can be done through tactical urbanism very quickly, starting from a policy change and getting speed limits lowered to then dropping down to curb build-outs and parklets to then full sealing off of streets, retro, uh, dropping out the curbs, and in some cases even adding a transit line as well, whether it be light rail or bus. Cars and parking don't attract patronage. If anything, they do the complete opposite. People do the shopping, not the car that's parked 95% of the time. Thus, business owners can overestimate customer share by transport mode. Remember, Perception, reality, streets, encourage, and the living room extensions are encouraged by this and encourage this. They are discouraged by this. If you want to do it another way, road, street, no extension to living rooms, extension to our living rooms. And again, the linger factor. Studies are coming out overseas and here in New Zealand. If we take transit or active modes to a place of hospitality or a town centre, we are likely to linger longer. And if we linger longer, we spend more. And it's often impromptu or impulse spending as well. So just remember that. This has been an audiovisual podcast. For Vision Week 2020, starting June 8. Vision Week New Zealand is about creating an ambitious long-term vision for our lifestyles, including economic, social, cultural, and environmental incomes. In this podcast, I looked at the residential side of the ledger of trying to achieve those outcomes. This ran in parallel and in tandem with the employment side of the ledger in the same creative industries. And both of these come the both of these are site specific to the interregional and regional issue of spatial planning and using spatial planning to influence our behaviors in urban form, remembering transport begets land use, land use begets transport, both beget the user environment of our city. And living room extensions and streets definitely inform land use and transport and inf which then influences our interaction our user environment our behaviors with the city